The Word of God, the Holy Bible, is a treasure and a gift beyond compare. Every passage of it points to a marvelous truth that God's love for man impelled him to step out of eternity and unite with his creation in order to redeem him from sin. Jesus Christ is both the author and subject of this precious word. Join us at the Superior Word each week as we search out this wonderful gift in search of Christ Jesus. Psalm 34, a psalm of David when he presented pretended madness before Abimelech, who drove him away, and he departed. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make its boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear of it and be glad. O oh, magnify the Lord with me, and let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord, and he heard me, and delivered me from all my fears. They looked to him and were radiant, and their faces were not ashamed. This poor man cried out, and the Lord heard him, and saved him out of all of his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps around all those who fear him, and delivers them. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who trusts in him. Oh, fear the Lord, you his saints. There is no want to those who fear him. The young lions lack and suffer hunger, but those who seek the Lord shall not lack any good thing. Come, you children, listen to me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. Who is the man who desires life and loves many days that he may see good? Keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking deceit. Depart from evil and do good. Seek, pursue, seek peace and pursue it. The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are open to their cry. The face of the Lord is against those who do evil to cut off the remembrance of them from the earth. The righteous cry out, and the Lord hears and delivers them out of all of their troubles. The Lord is near to those who have a broken heart, and saves such as have a contrite spirit. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. He guards all of his bones, not one of them is broken. Evil shall slay the wicked, and those who hate the righteous shall be condemned. The Lord redeems the soul of his servants, and none of those who trust in him shall be condemned. Amen, Amen to that. Uh, we have for a sermon today, Exodus 34, verses 10 through 26. And this is entitled, uh, Behold, I am making a covenant. Starting in verse 10, and he said, Behold, I am making a covenant before all your people. I will do marvels such as not have been done in all the earth, nor in any nation, and all the people among you, uh, whom you are, shall see the work of the Lord. For it is an awesome thing that I will do with you. Observe what I command you this day. Behold, I am driving out from before you the Amorite and the Canaanite and the Hittite and the Perizzite and the Hivite and the Jebusite. Take heed to yourself, lest you make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land where you are going, lest it be a snare in your midst. But you shall destroy their altars, break their sacred pillars, and cut down their wooden images. For you shall worship no other god. For the Lord, whose name is Jealous, is a jealous God. Lest you make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land, and they play the harlot with their gods, and make sacrifice to their gods, and one of them invites you, and you eat of his sacrifice, and you're, you take of his daughters for your sons, and his daughters play the harlot with their gods, and make your sons play the harlot with their gods, you shall make no molded gods for yourselves. The feast of unleavened bread you shall keep, Seven days you shall eat unleavened bread, as I commanded you in the appointed time in the month of Aviv. For in the month of Aviv you came out from Egypt. All that open the womb are mine, and every male firstborn among your livestock, whether ox or sheep. But the firstborn of a donkey you shall redeem with a lamb, and if you will not redeem him, then you shall break his neck. All the firstborn of your sons you shall redeem, and none shall appear before me empty-handed." Six days you shall work, but on the seventh day you shall rest. In plowing time and in harvest you shall rest. And you shall observe the feast of weeks and the first fruits of the wheat harvest and the feast of ingathering at the year's end. Three times in the year all your young men shall appear before the Lord, the Lord God of Israel. For I will cast out the nations before you and enlarge your borders. Neither will any man covet your land when you go up to appear before the Lord your God three times in the year. You shall not offer the blood of my sacrifice with leaven, nor shall the sacrifice of the feast of the Passover be left until morning. 
the first of the first fruits of your land you shall bring to the house of the Lord your God. You shall not boil a young goat in its mother's milk. There's a lot going on in these verses today. And some of them seem entirely disconnected from the other verses, but that really is not the case. The Lord has shown grace to Israel rather than destroying them. Now, he is refining many of the laws that he previously gave to them. He's also repeating in part or in whole some of them as well. At one point in the passage, the people are forbidden from making a covenant with the people of the land, sacrificing to their gods or intermingling with them through marriage. This is actually called harlotry. The reason for this is that in doing any of these things, their hearts will be turned away from worshiping the Lord their God. The rest of the Old Testament shows us continual violations of this, and the results were exactly as prophesied. We, as a species, have a perverse spot in our hearts where we want to flagrantly disobey God and turn from him. Edgar Allan Poe would call it the imp of the perverse. Now, when I say the imp, I want you to think of the devil and his lies. We are prone to doing something which is self-destructive simply because it takes hold of us and impels us to do it. Although his words are large, often difficult, and at times obsolete from our modern tongue, what Poe says well reflects the attitude that we have. Listen to how he describes our often hell-bent nature. He says, we stand upon the brink of a precipice. We peer into the abyss. We grow sick and dizzy. Our first impulse is to shrink from the danger. Unaccountably, we remain. By slow degrees, our sickness and dizziness and horror become merged in a cloud of unnameable feeling. By gradations, still more imperceptible, this cloud assumes shape, as did the vapor from the bottle out of which arose the genus in the Arabian Nights. But out of this, our cloud upon the precipice's edge, there grows into palpability a shape far more terrible than any genus or any demon of a tale, and yet it is but a thought, although a fearful one, and one which chills the very marrow of our bones with the fierceness of the delight of its horror. It is merely the idea of what would be our sensations during the sweeping precipitancy of a fall from such a height. And this fall, this rushing annihilation, for the very reason that it involves that one most ghastly and loathsome of all most ghastly and loathsome images of death and suffering which have ever presented themselves to our imagination, for this very cause we do now the most vividly desire it. And because our reason violently deters us from the brink, therefore do we the most impetuously approach it. There is no passion in nature so demonically impatient as that of him who, shuddering upon the edge of a precipice, thus meditates a plunge. To indulge for a moment in any attempt at thought is to be inevitably lost. For reflection but urges us to forbear, and therefore it is, I say, that we cannot. If there be no friendly arm to check us, or if we fail in a sudden effort to prostrate ourselves backward from the abyss, we plunge and are destroyed. You can see Adam in the fall of man right in that. Poe's character was consumed with what he called the imp of the perverse. A thought entered his mind which would surely condemn him if he spoke it, and yet speak it he did. He tried walking quickly from it, then running, but it overtook him. He could no more constrain himself than a balloon could keep from bursting when overfilled. Poe understood human nature better than almost any. Outside of the Bible itself, I personally know of no source that peers so deeply into the human soul. We all carry with us the imp, and it will tear us away from what we most cherish, life. But the Bible also gives us a cure from being consumed by the imp. It is to hide God's word in our heart and to hold fast to it, remembering it and reciting it. It is the safety for our soul and the protection from the eternal curse. Our text verse today comes from Malachi chapter 4. Remember the law of Moses, my servant, which I commanded him in Horeb for all Israel. With the statutes and judgments, behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the earth with a curse. 
Each word of today's passage is connected because they are given as a safeguard from the onslaught of the imp. The people are being reminded in law, and the law contains reminders in life. The right of the firstborn, the calling to the feasts, even not boiling a young goat in its mother's milk. It is all given to ward off the imp and to have the people fix their eyes on the Lord. This is what we are asked to do as well, to fix our eyes on Jesus, to fix our thoughts on Jesus, and to meditate on God's laws day and night. These things have value because they will keep us from the imp, and they will keep us from the lake of fire where the imp calls us from. Our lessons are all to be found in his superior word. And so let's turn to that precious word once again, and may God speak to us through his word today, and may his glorious name ever be praised. I have two thoughts for you today. The first is the Lord, whose name is Jealous. It's verses 10 through 17. Verse 10, and he said, behold, I make a covenant. The last words of Moses in the previous verse, before we got to this passage today, said, Lord, let my Lord, I pray, go among us, even though we are a stiff-necked people, and pardon our iniquity and our sin and take us as your inheritance. The words will now confirm that this request is granted. Israel will be made into the Lord's inheritance. This is implied in the words, Behold, I am cutting a covenant. It confirms that the covenant will be worked out. Israel had broken it, and it could have been annulled in its entirety. If so, they would have been susceptible to the entire weight of the penalty of death, pictured in the original shedding of the blood of the animals. But they had found grace. Moses had interceded for the people and the Lord had relented from fulfilling the terrifying terms of the covenant which they had violated. Now it is God that makes or cuts the covenant. It is one-sided and therefore if there be quarrels, we bear all the blame. If there be peace, God must have all the glory. The action here doesn't mean that the original covenant is reinstated, nor does it mean that there is a new covenant. The grace of God in forgiving the transgressions of the people describes rather his future role as a constant, continuous establishment of a covenant. Therefore, and this is an important precept that we're getting out of this verse right here, the entire time of his dealing with Israel under this covenant is a transitional phase, which will be in anticipation of a new covenant. This is confirmed many hundreds of years later by the words of Jeremiah the prophet. Here's what he said. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. The Lord did not make a new covenant with the church. He made it with the house of Israel and with Judah. We happen to be the recipients of that. They rejected it, and that's why they were exiled. And we've been waiting 2,000 years for them to come back into this covenant and to accept it. So understand this. It is not a church thing that's going on per se, meaning the Gentile-led church age. This is a Jewish thing, the people of Israel, that this is being directed to. I'm going to continue with his words from Jeremiah. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in that day, speaking of where we're at now, that I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt, my covenant which they broke, though I was a husband to them, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with them, with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts and I will be their God and they shall be my people. No more shall every man teach his neighbor and every man his brother saying, know the Lord for they all shall know me from the least of them to the greatest of them says the Lord for I will forgive their iniquity and their sin I will remember no more. The word of the Lord through Jeremiah points back to the covenant which was broken by Israel after being brought out by the Lord. Thus, what is being renewed right here is a transitional phase of God's redemptive workings, and it only anticipates a new covenant at some point in the future. Verse 10 continues, Before all your people I will do marvels. The word before is neged. It gives the idea of right in front of or in the view of all. It is the same word used in the 23rd Psalm when speaking of the Lord's provision being provided right before the eyes of David's enemies with the words, you prepare a table before, or neged, me, in the presence of my enemies. This promise of marvels is said to be before your people, meaning the people of Israel. They will personally behold what the Lord will do. 
In this, it will bring about a twofold aspect for them to consider. First, it will be that their faith in God should be strengthened as they see the marvels that he does, but it will actually bring about a more terrifying culpability when the people stray. Having personally seen the work of the Lord, they will thus be more accountable should they reject him. Verse 10 going on, such as has not been done in all the earth nor in any nation. The words have been done here form a single verb, bara. When used in relation to God, it signifies his creative effort. It is the word which was used in Genesis 1, verse 1, concerning the creation of the heavens and the earth. The next time it will be used in scripture will be in Numbers chapter 16, confirming the word of the Lord right now spoken. Listen to this. By this you shall know that the Lord has sent me to do all these works, for I have not done them of my own will. If these men die naturally, like all men, or if they are visited by the common fate of all men, then the Lord has not sent me. But if the Lord creates bara, a new thing, and the earth opens its mouth and swallows them up with all that belongs to them, and they go down alive into the pit, then you will understand that these men have rejected the Lord. The Lord created a new thing in the destruction of those who rebelled against him. This is the type of marvel that he would work in and among the people with whom this covenant was being made. Their eyes would behold marvels never conceived of. Verse 10 going on. And all the people among whom you are shall see the work of the Lord. In verse 9, Moses said to the Lord, If I have now found grace in your sight, O Lord, let my Lord, I pray, go among us, even though we are a stiff-necked people, and pardon our iniquity and our sin, and take us as your inheritance. The Lord now uses the same term, among, but he contrasts the words, go among us with among whom you are. What this means is that Moses is the one who interceded for the people. He is considered the administrator of the law. And so even after his death, it will be recognized that the great marvels of the Lord will be among the people of Moses. Jesus confirms this thought with the words from Matthew 23, verse 2, which say this, The scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. The law is called the law of Moses. The authority of the law is called Moses' seat. Thus, the great deeds of the Lord will be before all the people among whom you are, meaning Moses. Therefore, the marvels which are spoken of here are not just constrained to the lifetime of Moses, but they are all of the marvels which will occur during the time of the law, culminating in the greatest works of all under the law, those of Christ, to include the fulfillment of the law of Moses itself. Verse 10 continues, For it is an awesome thing that I will do with you. The word translated here as awesome is yare. It is a noun which means fright or terrible act, but it includes the thought of being placed in a state of fearful reverence. The work which will be accomplished by the Lord will be a terror. It will be a terror to the enemies of Israel as they are destroyed for the sake of Israel, and it will be a terror to the people of Israel as they are destroyed for violating the covenant which is set before them. The world will behold the might, power, and majesty of the Lord in both contexts, a work which continues on to this day as he continues to bring the terror which was promised 3,500 years ago. And again, the Lord says that this will be a thing that I will do with you. He uses Moses as the cause of the terror which will proceed from the Lord. As I said, this continues on to this day. But how can that be if the law of Moses is annulled in Christ? It is because Daniel 9 verses 24 through 27 promises seven more years to the people of Israel to come into the new covenant through the work of Christ. This is why even to this day, the terror of the Lord as described in these verses applies to all who witness what he will do to and through Israel. And you wonder why Israel is in the news all the time and the whole world is focused on that teeny little piece of land and the hatred of that group of people exists. It's because of exactly what we're looking at right here, right now. When we think of the ultimate terror of this, that of the tribulation period, we can see the immensity of the words spoken at this time to Moses. He probably had no idea the scope of what he was being told for Israel, the terror will be realized in its fullness in the words, Alas, for that day is great, so that none is like it, and it is the time of Jacob's trouble. 
but he shall be saved out of it. That's Jeremiah 30, speaking of the final seven years of the tribulation period. For the world at large, the terror will be realized in the words of Revelation. Here's what it says there. Fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath has come and who is able to stand? Coming soon to a tribulation period near you, the whole world is going to come under the judgment of God for Israel and because of Israel. Verse 11, observe what I command you this day. This is spoken to Moses personally. He will be given a set of commands, most of which are positive in nature. The admonition here is to ensure that the people, typified by Moses, were to adhere to the commands. But the Lord doesn't immediately give the commands. Before doing so, he makes a promise on which the commands are actually dependent. And that's verse 11 continuing. Behold, I am driving out from before you the Amorite and the Canaanite and the Hittite and the Perizzite and the Hivite and the Jebusite. These words both form one of the wonders the Lord promises he will do, and they form the basis on which the subsequent commands will be given. He promises that it will be by his power, not Israel's, that the nations would be driven out. That Israel was used in the process does not negate his having accomplished it. Rather, Israel was a part of his arsenal in making it come about. That this is one of the coming wonders that he will perform is seen many years later in the words of King David. Here's what it says from 2 Samuel chapter 7. And who is like your people, like Israel, the one nation on the earth whom God went to redeem for himself as a people and to make for himself a name and to do for you yourself great and awesome deeds for your land before your people whom you redeemed for yourself from Egypt, the nations and their gods. For you have made your people Israel, your very own people forever. And you, Lord, have become their God. David spoke both of the redemption of the people from Egypt, but also from the nations, meaning many of the nations mentioned here in this verse right now. The Lord promised he would do this, and he fulfilled his promise. But just as importantly as this, the driving out of these nations is necessary because it will provide Israel the basis for the laws which he will now pronounce. Verse 12, take heed to yourself. These words are an imperative. The heart is prone to wander and the flesh is weak. Moses is being instructed now that a positive mindset and action is required in order to keep from failing. And lest we think we're exempted from this while we live in this dispensation of grace, Paul warns us in the church otherwise. He says in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, speaking to all of you, Therefore, let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. No temptation is overtaking you except as such is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. But with the temptation will also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. Verse 12 continues. Lest you make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land where you are going, lest it be a snare in your midst. The nations of the land were to be driven out for several specific reasons. First, they had become so perverse and ungodly that the judgment of God was due them. This is seen in Leviticus chapter 18. You shall therefore keep my statutes and my judgment and shall not commit any of these abominations, a whole list of which he had given, either any of your own nation or any stranger who dwells among you. For all of these abominations the men of the land have done who were before you, and thus the land was defiled. Secondly, it was promised to Abraham and his chosen descendants. Israel was that select line, and the time of fulfillment of that promise was rapidly approaching. Here's what was promised to Abraham in Genesis 15. Now as for you, you shall go to your fathers in peace. You shall be buried at a good old age, but in the fourth generation they shall return here. For the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. God was gracious to the Amorites, giving them a chance, 400 full years to turned to him and they failed and Israel became the Lord's weapon of destruction to drive those people out. And the third reason is that if they did stay, meaning the people in the land with Israel and Israel made a covenant with them, the Lord now says that such an action would become a snare in your midst. This is a close repeat of the words of Exodus 23, which said this, you shall make no covenant with them nor with their gods. They shall not dwell in your land lest they make you sin against me. For if you serve their gods, it will surely be a snare to you. A covenant with the people would imply a covenant with their gods. Such an action would be sin against the Lord. 
Making alliances with those who worship other gods will inevitably result in a weakening of the true faith. It is as a snare by which one is caught. It is as if somebody is walking along and without even seeing it lying there, they step in it and they're set on a path to destruction. This is the end for all who will mingle the true faith with that which is false. Unfortunately, Israel failed to heed. Even today, 3,500 years later, they continue to fail in this regard. And guess what? The church too. We completely have failed to heed this admonition. Verse 13, but you shall destroy their altars, break down their sacred pillars, and cut down their wooden images. In Exodus 23, the people were told to break down the sacred pillars of the inhabitants. The Lord adds on to that now here. First, they are to destroy the altars. The word nathats or destroy is introduced into the Bible here. It gives the idea of breaking down and thus to completely destroy. The Lord had mandated what type of altar was acceptable to use right after the giving of the Ten Commandments, and that was the only type that could be used before him. These were pagan altars which were to be utterly removed from the land. Next, they were to break down their sacred pillars. The false gods were identified with the images which represented them. They were to be utterly broken down. They were to be crushed, burned, and left as nothing but refuse. It was the practice of conquering forces to go ahead and take the idols of the vanquished nations and keep them as trophies of victory. However, this was not to be condoned in Israel. They were false, they could not save their own people, and they could only entice Israel to eventually look to them for what they could never provide. The wicked king Amaziah actually did this very thing. Here's what it says in 2 Chronicles chapter 25. Now it was so, after Amaziah came from the slaughter of the Edomites, that he brought the gods of the people of Seir, set them up to be his gods, and bowed down before them and burned incense to them. Therefore the anger of the Lord was aroused against Amaziah, you think? And he sent him a prophet who said to him, Why have you sought the gods of the people which could not rescue their own people from your hand? Duh! Thirdly, they were to cut down their wooden images. These images, or Asherah, are introduced into scripture here, but it's not the last time you're going to see them. They were based on a goddess of the same name found in Phoenicia, Assyria, Canaan, and elsewhere. They will be noted all the way throughout the Old Testament as being worshipped by Israel. Exactly as the Lord warned, they would become a snare to his people. Verse 14, for you shall worship no other god. Each of these things that was instructed to be broken down was because it represented a false god. Hence the term key or for is given. The plural other gods of the first commandment is made singular. You shall worship no other god. The Lord is being explicit because the people had already done this on their own. Fashioning a false god, erecting an altar to it, and sacrificing to it. In his hot displeasure, he was prepared to destroy the people. Now he is explicitly stating that as the people of the land were to be destroyed, so should their false religious implements be so destroyed. He has promised to take care of the inhabitants, and he expects Israel to take care of what they leave behind. These things served no other purpose but that of false worship and idolatry. Verse 14 continues, For the Lord whose name is Jealous is a jealous God. This is a very, very unpopular set of words for many. I'm talking about scholars and lay people alike. People find the thought of jealousy being ascribed to God as something unworthy of his divine nature. But this is absurd for several reasons. First is, he claims the title to himself. Thus, challenging the attribute is a challenge against him. Secondly, if God was not jealous of himself and his own honor, it would mean that idolatry was unimportant to him. If this were true, then it would mean that he cared nothing for his creatures. Idolatry includes many negatives, such as adultery, self-flagellation, and even human sacrifice. Thus, it would be contrary to the nature of God for him to not be jealous. Thus, the Lord's name and his character answer one to the other. The Lord's name is Kana and El Kana who? A jealous God is he. Further, in Proverbs 6, verse 34, jealousy is called a husband's fury. This is what is seen here. The covenant made between the Lord and the people of Israel was a type of marriage contract. In the worship of other gods, the fury of their husband, his righteous displeasure would be brought out of him. Finally, this type of jealousy does not indicate jealousy of success in another. It speaks of the defense of his own honor and his own glory. 
When one bows to another God, the Lord, he's not jealous of that false God receiving worship. His jealousy is having been denied what he is justly due. His words in Isaiah showed this thought very well. It says, I am the Lord, that is my name, and my glory I will not give to another, nor my praise to carved images. As Matthew Henry states about this verse, those who cannot worship God aright, who do not worship him only. Verse 15, lest you make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land, and they play the harlot with their gods and make sacrifices to their gods, and one of them invites you and you eat of his sacrifice. The idea of verses 15 and 16 together is kind of one thing leads to another. If the people were to make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land, they would then be joined in a familiar way with those people. But the Lord promised to drive them out of the land. A covenant would imply that they now receive safe harbor within that land. This would be contrary to the work of the Lord in expelling them. Now, with their safe harbor, they would continue to play the harlot with their gods. This is the very first time in the Bible that the word zana or harlot is used in a spiritual sense. And it is used of the Gentile people in relation to their gods. The Lord is their creator too, and yet they sacrifice to that which is not God. In these words, his jealousy is as evident as that in which he proclaims towards Israel, but they are not his redeemed people, and so they are to be destroyed. But with safe harbor, they instead sacrifice to their own gods, and they even invite Israel to join them. The covenant brothers will now be brothers in worship also. Verse 16, and you take of his daughters for your sons, and his daughters play the harlot with their gods, and you make your sons play the harlot with their gods. Brothers in worship will inevitably become brothers by blood. The relations will become deeply rooted in family. In joining in marriage, there will be a joining in a false worship, and the sons and daughters of Israel would soon play the harlot with false gods. We see this in our world all the time. Christians go off and marry somebody of another religion and the family suddenly caves in and it all gets muddled out and the Lord is forgotten. Here, the thought of marriage tie between the Lord and Israel is seen in its full sense. A covenant was just made with the Lord resembling the rite of marriage. Just as when a woman who goes out from her husband to another man is considered adultery, well, at least it used to be in this nation. It's not anymore, but it was considered adultery at one time, so the worship of other gods by the people of the Lord. He does not want this to happen. This is the idea which is being conveyed here concerning sacrificing to and worshiping of other gods. It is a lesson that Israel failed to heed, and they were swept up in idolatry from the least even to the greatest. Kings, as great as King Solomon, intermarried, and they left the Lord in worship of other gods with their wives. Verse 17, you shall make no molded gods for yourselves. This verse ends that very long chiasm that I gave you a copy of, which started all the way back at verse 32, 1. The chiasm opened with an example of idolatry and the making of the golden calf. We now have been given warnings against idolatry in these commands of the reworked and continually reworking covenant of the Lord. Here, as a final warning, he commands explicitly against what they had done by using the words Elohe Maseka, or molded gods. The word molded was first used when speaking of the golden calf which Aaron had made. Now it is warned against explicitly in any type, shape, or form. No molded gods, folks. I am a God of grace, long-suffering and kind. I am a God of mercy, forgiving transgression and sin. But I am a jealous God. To harlotry I am not blind, and in your harlotry you will find yourself done in. If you go a-whoring after other gods away from me, your heart will be led completely astray. My fury will rise against you most assuredly, and I will destroy you and your wicked way. Cling to me. Let me be your only God. Follow me, and I will give you life and love. Pursue me always in this life you trod, and I will shower you with blessings. Yes, blessings from above. Our second thought today is a shorter thought, close fellowship with the Lord. It's verses 18 through 26. Verse 18, the feast of unleavened bread you shall keep. Seven days you shall eat unleavened bread as I commanded you. In the appointed time of the month of Aviv, for in the month of Aviv you came out from Egypt. In what seems a real abrupt change in commands, a feast of the Lord is suddenly introduced here. It will be followed up with the other two pilgrim feasts. There's actually nothing abrupt about this. 
Rather, it is a logical progression of thought. The people are warned against idolatry, and then they are admonished to keep the precepts which acknowledge them as the people of the Lord. As the Lord's people, they would fellowship with him intimately through these feasts. Instead of sacrificing to other gods, they would be sacrificing to him. One must ask why, though. Why the double feast of the Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread is simply called the Feast of Unleavened Bread? The reason is that they have already been redeemed. The Passover, though observed annually, was a commemorative feast. The Feast of Unleavened Bread is an instructive feast. It signified being separated from the heathen world. They were to commemorate this annual feast in order to show their set-apart status from the nations of the world. Every year at Ha'aviv, or the time of fresh young ears of grain, they were to observe this feast. Verse 19, all that open the womb are mine, and every male firstborn among your livestock, whether ox or sheep. The term peter, or open, was introduced into the Bible in Exodus 13. It was used five times where the law of the firstborn was given in great detail. Now it is mentioned again, three times in verses 19 and 20. As this mandate was given before the giving of the law, it is now brought into the law itself. It is not an option, but rather a command which must be adhered to. This claim on the firstborn is an assertion by the Lord that all born to Israel, man or beast, were his. But the firstborn was taken as representative of that fact. The people were set apart to him. The clean animals were his. Verse 20, but the firstborn of a donkey you shall redeem with a lamb. And if you will not redeem him, then you shall break his neck. All the firstborn of your sons you shall redeem. The donkey is representative of all unclean animals. They were not to be offered to the Lord by sacrifice, and so they either had to be redeemed by a clean animal or they were to be killed. A picture is made here, though. Think of us. We're Gentiles, okay? This is picturing the Gentile people of the world. The donkey is symbolic of Gentiles. They needed to be redeemed with a lamb. Guess what? Christ is our lamb. He's our redeemer. Or have its neck broken. In picture, the Gentile had never been redeemed by Christ. Instead, his neck remained turned in defiance to him. This is why the breaking of the neck is chosen. Human sacrifice was unacceptable, and so all human sons of Israel were also required to be redeemed. Verse 20 continues, And none shall appear before me empty-handed. The word empty-handed is rekam. It gives the sense of something being vain. The word was used in Exodus 3, verse 21, when the Lord promised that Israel would not come out of Egypt empty-handed. Here's what it says there. So I will stretch out my hand and strike Egypt with all my wonders, which I will do in your midst. And after that, he will let you go. And I will give this people favor in the sight of the Egyptians, and it shall be when you go out that you shall not go out empty-handed or recom. The intent here is that just as I brought you out of Egypt with hands which are not empty, so you shall come before me with hands that are not empty. To do so would be a vain thing. The Lord provided for Israel. Israel was to acknowledge that. Verse 21, six days you shall work, but on the seventh day you shall rest. The mandate of the Sabbath rest has already been seen at the time of the giving of manna in Exodus 16. It was brought in as the fourth of the Ten Commandments in Exodus 20. It was reiterated in the Book of the Covenant in Exodus 23, and it was again given as an appendix to the direction for the construction of the sanctuary in Exodus chapter 31. It is given again now for the following reason, which is tied into the annual harvest feasts. Verse 21 continues, in plowing time and in harvest you shall rest. The word harish or plowing is very rare in the Bible. It's used only three times. Normally the Bible speaks of seed time and harvest, but here it speaks of plowing. This is set in contrast to reaping then. The times where hard physical work was required, it was still to be stopped on the Sabbath day. And this is especially so because if the weather was bad all week, these tasks may have been urgently needed. However, guess what? The Lord may provide a marvelously beautiful day on the Sabbath. Oh boy, guess what? The obvious thought is the Lord's given us this beautiful day to go out and catch up on all the things we couldn't do during the week. We're going to be fruitful and multiply. But rather they are being told now that this was not the case. The Sabbath was not to be violated. Verse 22, and you shall observe the feast of weeks of the first fruits of wheat harvest. 
Chag Shavuot, or the Feast of Weeks, gets its name from a seven-week period which started at the bringing in of the first fruits to the Lord, picturing Christ's resurrection. This is detailed in Leviticus 23, verses 10 and 11. In Exodus 23, the same feast was called Hakatsir, or the harvest. The feast in Greek and in the New Testament is called Pentecost, meaning the 50th. That's a picture of the giving of the Holy Spirit. This grain harvest, which began 50 days earlier, was now considered finished. As the Feast of the Harvest, it was a celebration of the blessing of labor in the field. Verse 22 continues, And the Feast of Ingathering at the year's end, Chag Ha'asif, or Feast of Ingathering, is the final of the three mandatory pilgrim feasts. It is only called by this name here and in Exodus 23, verse 16. When the feast is mentioned elsewhere, it is called Sukkot, or tabernacles. It is referring to the ending of the harvest season when the labors of the field are gathered in from that field. The dating for this feast will later be fixed as the 15th day of the seventh month and it will last for seven days. This corresponds to around October on our calendar and we're going through this feast right now in Israel. There are various crops that grow in Israel throughout the summer months and by this time they're almost all harvested. Generally, the last crops to be gathered in are the grapes, figs, pomegranates, almonds, and olives, but specifically the grapes. And the reason why is that's a picture of the end time grape wrath of God, the harvest of grapes. So everything that we're seeing in these feasts is actually being worked out in human history and what God is doing with Israel, for Israel, and for all of the people of the world or against them. All right. And the term for end here is tekufa. It is a noun used for the first of just four times. It means a coming around or a circuit. And it comes from the verb nakaf, which means a circle or to go around. At this point of turning, the cycle of the agricultural life that they lived would be ready to start once again. And that's why it's given this term. Verse 23, three times in the year, all your men shall appear before the Lord, the Lord God of Israel. This verse is almost a repeat of Exodus 23, verse 17. The only difference is that it includes the words Elohe Yisrael, or the God of Israel, at the end of it. The Lord Yehovah is specifically now said to be the Lord Yehovah, the God of Israel. Verse 24, for I will cast out the nations before you. The Lord has promised to do this. Though the people did not fully obey the Lord concerning making covenants with the inhabitants, nor did they fully obey in driving out all of the people, the nations were essentially driven out from the land. Israel ruled the land of Canaan as was originally promised to Abraham back in Genesis chapter 12. Verse 24 continues, and enlarge your borders. Later in Genesis 15, the Lord promised Abraham an enlargement of the borders originally promised. That is repeated now, and it was fulfilled at the time of David and leading into the rule of Solomon. Though they only possessed this larger expanse of land for a very short time, the promise was fulfilled. Verse 24 continues, Neither will any man covet your land when you go up to appear before the Lord your God three times in a year. Now think of those words. I'm going to read them again and think of this promise. Neither will any man covet your land when you go up to appear before the Lord your God three times in a year. These words are found nowhere else in Scripture, but they are so memorable that no other recording of them is needed. Even though every male of Israel was to present himself before the Lord, leaving every single city and town with only women and children, the Lord made a promise that they would never need to fear during these feasts, even with no protection at all in a country larger than the state of New Jersey. With its increased borders at the time of Solomon, it was far, far larger than that. It is an amazing promise, but it was a promise based on the obedience of the people. Verse 25, you shall not offer the blood of my sacrifice with leaven, nor shall the sacrifice of the feast of Passover be left until morning. With but a few differences, this verse is almost the same as Exodus 23, 18. In both verses, the blood is the object of what is offered instead of the sacrifice. It says you shall not offer the blood. As the Bible says that the life is in the blood, and because grain offerings were considered separate offerings than sacrifices, it is referring to the Passover, which is a type of Christ's cross. Thus, it is called my sacrifice. Remember, Jesus is, Paul says in the New Testament about Jesus, Christ, our Passover lamb, is sacrificed for us. Leaven was to be completely purged from the home prior to the slaughtering of the Passover. 
This is a picture of the sinless Christ who shed his blood for us. There was no sin to be found in him, just as there was no leaven to be found in the homes of those who partook of the Passover. There was to be nothing left of the lamb by morning. This was explained in Exodus chapter 12. You shall let none of it remain until morning, and what remains of it until morning you shall burn with fire. Verse 26 finishes with these words. The first of the first fruits of your land you shall bring to the house of the Lord your God. You shall not boil a young goat in its mother's milk. Verse 26 is identical to Exodus 23 verse 19, word for word. Very interesting, curious verse, isn't it? Very interesting. But because it's identical to Exodus 23, 19, I'm going to send you there either by my written sermon or by YouTube for you to get all of the exciting details. Suffice it to say that every word of this verse, if you remember the meaning of it, points to the work of Christ, his resurrection, and all the way through to the end times. In fact, each of these precepts that we've looked at today picture Christ intimately. I've only touched on what they picture. If you missed those previous sermons, go back and watch them to get a full appreciation for all that is entailed in them. There is truly marvel to be seen in how Christ is so beautifully revealed. Today, I simply took the time to highlight the changes from any previous passages and to explain any additions. But be sure that it is all about Jesus Christ. The Old Testament was given to show us what lay ahead in him. Without him, every one of us is lost. We follow the imp of the perverse and we turn our hearts away from God, but with Christ, we are given the ability to focus our thoughts anew and to redirect our hearts and our lives to a state that God finds good and pleasing. And it is all based on faith and grace. If you have never received the good news of Jesus Christ, please do it today. He died so that we can live. Through the blood of his cross, we are reconciled to God and we are brought near to him. And so just in case somebody here today has never called on Jesus, let me do what I do each week and just very quickly explain to you that the Bible says you have sin in your life. If you deny that, there's not much I can do to help you. I, I assure you, you have sin in your life. You've told a lie, you've done something wrong, which will offend an infinitely holy God. And that infinitely separates us. Even if you've only committed one sin in your life, you are infinitely separated from him. He's out there, we're here. We're in the stream of time and we're going this way and we cannot go back before what we did and undo it. And so there's a disconnect. And the only way to reconcile that was by the work of Jesus Christ. He, fully God, stepped out of his infinite realm and he united with his own creation in the womb of a woman, who, by the way, was going forward in the stream of time. And so he is fully man. And he lived that life under the law that we're looking at right here perfectly. He never violated a precept of this law in any way, shape, or form. That's what the three synoptic gospels are given for, is to show us that he was qualified to take away the sin of the world if he would die in fulfillment of this law without having sinned. Born without sin, never sinned under the law, voluntarily gave his life up as a sacrifice of atonement for the sins that you and I have committed. Then it doesn't matter if it was one lie or if it was murdering 50 people. You're separated from God. And Christ can wash away every one of those sins, every single one of them, because he is God and because he is the perfect man. So if you've never taken the time to simply ask Jesus Christ to forgive you, please do it today. The Bible says all have sinned and all fall short of the glory of God, and that the wages of sin is death. We earn wages because we go to work every single week, and we get paid based on what we do. Our wages of sin is that we die. There are two deaths in the Bible. The spiritual death, which we earned the moment that Adam sinned, and all people are in that. We're born spiritually dead, and we're gonna die spiritually dead. And then there's a second death, which is our physical death. And if we don't get that spiritual death corrected before the physical death comes, we're gonna be separated from God for all eternity. But Jesus Christ came to fix that. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And the Bible makes it so simple. If you call on the name of the Lord Jesus, you will be saved. Just believe in your heart that God did this through him and that he was raised from the grave and you will be saved. I would ask you to do that today because you don't know your last moment on this earth. None of us do. We've all lost somebody that we love and that we cherish. We've lost friends. I've got a friend in the hospital right now that almost punched his ticket this week because he had a, a colon polyp removed and the guy nicked his colon. And his name is Nick, by the way, so Nick's colon got nicked and he almost didn't make it. 
And I'd miss him. I've known him my whole life since I was a little boy. We played baseball out on uh, Siesta Beach together when we were young. We don't know. Well, I know Nick is saved. He's been to my house many times. And when I went around the U.S. in 2010, he's the one that held the party for me at his house. And people came by to shoo us out of here for 117 days. But other people may not be saved and they need Jesus and I would ask that one you would accept him as your Lord and Savior and two go tell other people about it let the redeemed of the Lord say so thank you our closing verse today comes from Deuteronomy chapter 4 take heed to yourselves lest you forget the covenant of the Lord your God which he made with you and make for yourselves a carved image in the form of anything which the Lord your God has forbidden you for the Lord your God is a consuming fire a jealous God. Okay? Next week is Exodus 34. It's verses 27 through 35. Don't think this title at all odd. It's entitled The Refulgency of God. That'll be our 96 Exodus sermon. And a lot of uh, dictionaries don't even have refulgency as a word. They only have the word refulgent. But I assure you that it's the word refulgency. And I've got a little story about that word for you. Nobody gets my humor. Nobody. And if you wait till next week, you'll, you'll get a little snippet of it, about it, uh, one paragraph long on the word refulgency. Think about it. What, what about the word refulgency could I make a joke about? And then nobody would get it. Anyway, the Lord has you exactly where he wants you. He has a good plan and a purpose for you. Even if a deep ocean lies ahead of you, he can part the waters and he can lead you through it on dry ground. And so follow him and trust him and he will do marvelous things for you and through you. All right? Now, there's two people that have never been here before, and I'll explain this next part. I take from the New King James Version of the Bible, and I change it very, very little, and I make a poem out of the passage that we looked at. And that will, you get the uh, passage read at the beginning, you have to hear it all the way through the sermon a second time, and then you get a poem for him. And this is to help you remember what you have listened to. And I do this every single week, and we've got a poem of Genesis, we've got one on the book of Ruth, and we're, yeah two-thirds of the way through Exodus. So here we go. It's called The Covenant Continues. And he said, Behold, I make a covenant before all your people of every station. I will do marvels such as have not been done in all the earth, nor in any nation. And all the people among whom you are shall see the work of the Lord. For it is an awesome thing that I will do with you. The guarantee is my word. Observe what I command you this day. Behold, I am driving out from before you, as I determine is right, the Amorite and the Canaanite and the Hittite and the Perizzite, and the Hivite, and the Jebusite. Take heed to yourself, lest a covenant with the inhabitants you make of the land where you are going, lest it be a snare in your midst. This warning do take. But you shall destroy their altars, break their sacred pillars too, and cut down their wooden images, for no other god shall be worshipped by you. For the Lord whose name is Jealous is a jealous God, and for his name he is zealous. Lest you make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land, and they play the harlot with their gods, a terrible vice, and make sacrifice to their gods, and one of them invites you, and you eat of his sacrifice. And you take of his daughters for your sons, and his daughters the harlot with their gods play, and make your sons play the harlot with their gods. You shall make no molded gods for yourselves, this you shall obey. The feast of unleavened bread you shall keep, seven days you shall eat unleavened bread, as I commanded you in the appointed time of the month of Aviv, just as I have said. For in the month of Aviv, out from Egypt you came, and so the nations heard of my great name. All that opened the womb are mine, and every male firstborn among your livestock, whether ox or sheep, animals of the herd or of the flock. But the firstborn of a donkey you shall redeem with a lamb for my name's sake, and if you will not redeem him, then his neck you shall break. All the firstborn of your sons you shall redeem as I have commanded, and none shall appear before me empty-handed. Six days you shall work, but on the seventh day you shall rest. In plowing time in, and in harvest you shall rest. Do not disobey and thus put me to the test. And you shall observe the feast of weeks of the first fruits of the harvest of wheat and the feast of ingathering at the year's end when the harvest cycle is complete. Three times in the year all your men shall appear before the Lord, the Lord God of Israel, this according to my word. For I will cast out the nations before you, so understand, and enlarge your borders, so will it be, have no fear. Neither will any man covet your land when you go up to appear before the Lord your God three times in a year. You shall not offer the blood of my sacrifice with leaven. This I state to you as a warning. 
nor shall the sacrifice of the feast of the Passover be left until morning. The first of the first fruits of your land you shall bring to the house of the Lord your God. You shall not boil a young goat in its mother's milk. You shall not so defile the land upon which you trod. Lord God, you have given good laws to Israel, but as a people they failed you time after time. They turned their necks to you and raised their fists as well, but through it all you have proclaimed, this people is mine. And the people of your church have likewise turned away. We have shunned your grace and gone after works of our own, but still you hold out nail-scarred hands, even to this day, great mercy to your wayward people you have shown. Help us, Lord, to turn our hearts to you. Help us to be like Christ, ever faithful and true. And as we walk upon this world, let us ever give you praise. Yes, for the duration of our lives, whatever number be our days, for you are worthy, O God, yes, faithful and true. And so we shall in heaven's majestic home ever be praising you. Hallelujah and amen. amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this precious word. And I, I personally want to thank you that we are not under this law because every one of us would just be a basket case of neuroses. Thank you for the grace of Jesus Christ who has redeemed us from the power of the law and who has given us salvation by a simple act of faith. And then after that come our works. After that come the things that we should be doing for you. And the only person that will be hurt when we don't do them, yeah, we just go look in the mirror. We can't blame you. We just look in the mirror and say, yeah, I didn't want to do what the Lord said there and my life turned out pretty bad. But in the end, our salvation is secure through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. And we will stand before you in glory and we'll receive rewards based on what we have done for you or what we have failed to do. We'll receive losses. But in the end, your face we will see, and it will be marvelous. We'll walk in your presence and in your glorious light for all eternity because of the Lamb who was slain. All hail the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. Amen. Amen.